right, let's get our Bibles. We are in the book of Malachi, so we are back in Malachi. If you don't know where that is, uh, that's the last book in the Old Testament, so go to Matthew and turn left. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and we will get one to you. We are in Malachi chapter 3, and uh, we have a whole wonderful things to look at, a whole bunch of wonderful things to look at uh, today, and I'll tell you, there's something in this message because all I have, I have this literally written right on my notes, whole dot, 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 how's the attacks? I have been so whack attacked, Cadillac macked down this week, it's ridiculous. I mean, just boom, boom, boom. I mean, even on the day Thursday when I normally put together the message, this act, distraction, this happening, this so on and so forth. And so when it happens this heavy, I get pretty stoked because I know God's got something for us. So uh, let's not miss. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time now to be still and know that you are God. To be in your presence and to hear from you. And God, for that to happen, we need that merry miracle. But Lord, we need to sit at your feet and hear from you. Help us not be distracted as poor Martha was. Lord, we want to be in the room, Lord, with mind, body, and spirit, Lord. And so, Spirit of living God, I pray you would fall afresh on all of us right here, right now, today. May all of us decrease, as John the Baptist prayed, so that you would increase in us. Lord, I pray for the one here today who is still searching to know this is this truth? Is this just a belief system or a religion? Or are you in the room? And are you alive in the people around you? And so, Lord, reveal yourself today in and of and through your word, I humbly ask. Thank you, Jesus. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be right and acceptable in your sight. My God, my Father, my Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's go. We're in chapter three. So again, turn with me. We're doing part two of the three part of these three verses that I told you about. So we are in Malachi chapter three. Find me again at verse 10. And we're going to read 10 through 12 again and then be refreshed on where we're going with this. So after looking at all the things that God was saying to the people, then he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until, what does it say? Overflows. Till it overflows. Notice verse 11, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it may not destroy the fruits of the land nor your vine in the field cast its grapes says the Lord of hopes and all the nations will call you what? Blessed. Blessed for you shall be a delightful land says and notice again how many times in these small little verses says the Lord of hosts meaning God who is large and and he obviously is referencing this and parents we don't reference we don't continue to repeat something unless we know they really need to hear it or we see that they are listening but not hearing do you understand what I'm saying and so it's this reinforcement of getting this point through do you hear do you understand who it is that's speaking to you so we've been looking at remember they're in these three little verses I said we got to stop this going straight through the text we're going to pause with a little in-depth look because in this little three verse there's four powerful points. Remember the call of God, then the challenge of God, then there's a promise of God, and then there's the result. Now last week we looked of course at the call of God. And what was God's call out to his people? Bring the whole tithe. And hopefully you have that again circled as one word. The whole tithe into the storehouse. And I had so many wonderful people make comments to me going, wow, I've been in church for years, grew up in church, and I never heard the things that you were sharing about this. Because once again, we realize that when people think of the subject of tithing, they think it's about the subject of what? Money. money. It has absolutely nothing to do with money. And yet the enemy wants to throw all these different things at it. It's like, pfft, not even the subject at all. What is tithing about? Remember, I said the simplest way to understand it, it's focus. It's about focus. It's a focus check. Okay, not a finance check. And so we begin to understand what was God talking about when he says bring the whole tithe, they were bringing in their 10%. They would have known when they said, how are we not doing it? They would have known if they were not doing whatever they felt God was calling them the amount to give. What had they not brought? Remind me. Their hearts. Their hearts. 
You were going through the mechanical. You were doing it here. Here's the thing. This is what God wants me to do. I better do it because God said so or my wife will get upset with me or whatever it is. And so I'm going through these motions and I'm keeping the letter of the law. The Pharisees kept the letter of the law. And Jesus says, there's not a people further from me than these guys because I don't have their heart. They don't, more importantly, they don't have my heart. And so when we bring the whole tithe, it's what we bring is we bring in this incredible attitude of Gratitude. Yes, church. Again, why did he ask them to bring in the tithe? We were reminded. It was proof. We bring in our tithe as proof that we recognize the love of God. It's the whole thing. And so often we think, well, yes, Lord, I know it's because you've provided all the things and so I have the money because you've given it to me. No, 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 no. It's not even about that. It's not about sustenance. And again, if this is catching you way off, start with us in Malachi 1.1. But I have loved you, says the Lord. Malachi 3, 7, return to me that I will return to you. The people were churchified. They were doing all the things. They were good people. They weren't stealing and robbing and doing all these things from other people. And God says, I have these eight indictments against you. And he brings them before them. And he says, the one that breaks my heart is the fact that you are going through motions and you don't have the recognition that I love you. And I know that you don't know how much I love you by these actions. And you know, as I've said before, as a pastor, I don't think there's a harder sermon for me to preach than God loves you. Because they say God loves you, you go, uh-huh, but give me something to write down. God loves you, I know, but I, I came to get some deep nugget from you. You know, God loves you, yeah, yeah. I saw that on a bumper sticker, so. But you see, 90% of your drama in this room would disappear if you could just hear this sermon today. I'm killing you not, 90%. If you just did 30% of what God said, 90% of your drama would disappear. If we could truly grasp how much God loves you. I mean, let me just be kind of silly, stupid here for a moment. You know why I don't flirt around with other women? You know why I don't want to do all these other different things with, with other ladies? Because I am so incredibly loved by that woman up front that why would I be stupid? The love motivates me to want to be a lover, to be a faithful husband, to be this person who wants to bring and to build up because of the love. I mean, just think about God says, you who are evil know how to give good gifts and the love on. Just think about what God's love would truly do to our motivations. Are you tracking with me here? And see, that's where we need to understand that. Do you catch that what God is asking for is this reciprocity of the do you know my love? And so he asked for the whole tithe. And remember I said, noticeably recognize that's a different word than all. All is a mathematical term. Meaning I asked for the 10%, that's what I said here in Leviticus and so on. So bring in all the tithe. Uh -uh. It's not a mathematical and that's the problem. Most of us have a mechanical religion. We're here because this is the day of church that we go to. This is the hour that we come to. And we have the time, the quiet time in the morning. And we do this because this is what we do. And it's this mathematical, mechanical religion. And God says, close the door already. If I don't have your heart, we're not in Koinonia. It's not what we're going to learn about again today. It's not worship. And so this is where God is bringing to them. And so we were recognizing that there was not a response. Please check this down and look at overhead. There was not a response of love to love. And that was his issue. Why does he say bring in this whole tithe? Because there wasn't a response of love to love. Remember I talked about that when Cindy was saying something nice to me. And it's like, go on. You, know, you look so handsome. You can't leave the house in that shirt. I don't want you leaving the house looking that good. I'm like, oh, stop it. Stop <laughs> it. You know, but it's just like, wow. And God says, there is none of that. There is no, I've got this. I have a response of love to the love of God. We were reminded what? We love because what? He first, loved. he first loved us. And so that's where this whole thing comes from. This whole world is going nuts and crazy and, and just yelling and biting and one another and calling evil things. Why? No love. We sing about it. We talk about it. We have no clue what it is. The love of God. So today, we saw last week the call of God 
And that was to bring this whole tithe. Today we're going to do part two, the challenge of God. So take that down, the challenge of God. And what is the challenge of God? It's the next sentence. Is it overhead? Yes, it is. And God says this, and test me now in this, says the Lord. There's this challenge. He says, bring in the whole tithe, dot, 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 and all the things we've been talking about. And then God throws out a challenge. He says, test me now in this. Now you've got to understand why this is so crazy and powerful to have him say that because everywhere else in the Bible we are told not to test God right do not test the Lord do not put the Lord your God to the test it's all over the scriptures in fact Jesus himself if you remember when he was being tempted by Satan he says hey throw yourself off if you're the son of man you know and go ahead and do that and then the angels will come and they'll catch you and nothing will happen and he'll take care of you so show me that you really are this son of God his exact words, Matthew 4, 7, and Jesus said to them, on the other hand, it is written. He starts to quote Deuteronomy 6, 16. You shall not put the Lord, your God, to the test. And so I say all of that to make you realize like, okay, now if everywhere else we're told not to, then what is so stinking incredibly special about this that God here not only tells us it's okay to test him, he actually encourages us. He challenges us to do it. What's the idea? Well, I think the best way for us to grasp this is what God also said in Psalm 34 verse 8 when he says, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Good. So that's this tasting, this, that's this testing, is this tasting. Like I've said, it's you and I with those poor molahini who look at the poke and go, oh, it's raw, oh. <laughs> no, you really like it, here, try the sashimi. Oh, it's still wiggling. And you try one more time, and they're like, no, thank you, I don't eat anything uncooked. And then what do you say? Good, more for Good. me. Good, more for me, exactly. <laughs> We know people who haven't eaten sashimi in two, five, six years, whatever, and then they accidentally get it one time, and they're like, oh, wow, this was great. I've been missing this for six years. Yeah. <laughs> Family. God says, in essence, listen to me, please. Do what I ask you to do about this whole tithe. And he says, and see if I will not bless you beyond anything imaginable. And this is what's so sad because all these faith prosperity guys have grabbed all of this and it's so polluted this phrase that if you give in this financially way, then the way that God wants to bless is in financially. And the worst thing about a financial blessing is you can lose it. Comes and goes. It's of the temporal realm. I don't know about you, but I'm not looking for things of the temporal realm because the temporal is, guess what? It's what? It's temporal. It does not last. It does not satisfy. It may feel good for a moment, but it doesn't. And that's the whole thing. So God is saying, listen, I will bless you more than anything. And another way of putting it is bring me your whole heart and listen, and your whole understanding that I love you and that I have provided for you. This is what God is saying. I want you to bring to me. If you do this, you bring to me the understanding that I love you, you're responding to my love, and that I have provided for you. I'm going to bless you beyond anything you can imagine. And that's going to come next week with the promise. But my point here is this. He says, test me in this. So what was God's challenge? He was saying, if you're taking notes, very simply, get to know me. Get to know me by responding to, by answering my love with your love. That's how you get to know me, God's saying, is I want you to respond. Not here sit and nod, and not here go, wow, that sounds great. How come I don't feel it? Seems like other people in this room are more connected with God. God, are you out there? No, no, no. God says, first of all, will you respond to what you do know, what I have shown to you? Respond to my love with your love. And we learned just a little bit last time we were together is how do we do that? How do we respond to God's love? And one of the key phrases, as I begin to share with you, is worship. Worship is one of the ways in which we respond to his love with love. Now, again, Ilana did not know the message. So it was just cracking me up on she was praying for all of you before the message because I'm like, girl, did you just read my notes? <laughs> so again, a Holy Spirit's definitely got a message for all of us here today. But here's what you got to roll with me. 
Maybe today, maybe now, we're going to start connecting some dots, especially for some of you that have been church and dumb for so long in Christendom, and you've learned this and you learned that. Maybe now this verse, which has always been used for money talks or this or that and all the things, maybe, just maybe, will drop one notch deeper to understanding how incredibly loved we are. Amen? Amen? That is my prayer for you. I had the elders praying for you on that as I dove into this message today. So let me start here. What is this called? What we're doing right now. What is this called? Worship. This is called the, yeah, well, our term is celebrations. But it's called, if you look on a typical bulletin, it's called the what service? The worship service. My cards up until just recently said, worship services are, worship service times, 5, 30, 8, 10, 30. So this whole thing is called the worship service. Are you tracking with me? So what's funny is that we kind of even throw ourselves into a little bit of confusion by our own intro because then we come up and say, hey, you know what we're doing here is we're first having our worship, then we get into the word, and then we go back into worship, and yet the entire thing from the moment that we come here at 5.30 or 8 or 10.30, and we go all the way through that entire time is called the what service? service. The worship service. Now notice, we bring the whole tithe as part of our what? Our worship. So it's not the singy songs with Matt time. That's not worship. It's when we've gathered together in the house of the Lord as we come. And this entire time that we have set aside is our worship. Where God says, I want worshipers of clean hands and a pure heart. I want worshipers of spirit and truth. Now keep that in your mind as we go over what I'm about to talk to you. You see, some, when they come here, they put their tithe in right away. Some do it um, when they leave. Some do it during the response time. All of this where we're, quote, bringing in this whole tithe, meaning my attitude of gratitude, my reflection of adoration. Gosh, you love me so much. This whole part is part of the worship service. Now, see, the Bible is filled with exhortations to worship. Look overhead. I'm gonna blast a bunch of scripture with you today so that you know that this is not an opinion or a view of a man or a church, but God's word. 95, Psalm 95 says, Oh, come, let us what? Sing. Oh, come, let us sing for joy. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before, what does it say? His presence with? Thanksgiving. Okay, is that starting to connect some of the sermons with you already? Let's come to this presence, how? With thanksgiving, this is the whole heart, this is part of this whole tithe, is that I'm coming with not my gifts, not with my offerings, but with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully, second time in here, to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Now seriously, how can you read that psalm with an Eeyore voice? <laughs> Come let us worship and bow down. Let us sing before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. <laughs> and yet I wonder what ears the angels hear our praise. In what tone? You see, one commentator put it this way. We are created to worship our creator. When we give glory, remember last week I talked about those, those, those four points of the gospel? God made us. We were created to worship our creator. When we give glory to God, we place him on the throne of where? That's what I've been talking about since Matthew, I mean Malachi 1.1. 1, 1, and posture ourselves in the only position in which we find peace. One of submission and humility. Oh, that is so opposite of what the world has been teaching you from day one. We are created to worship our creator. When we give God, when choosing, when we give glory to God, we place him on the throne of our hearts and posture ourselves in the only position that we'll find what? Peace. Peace. And that's one of submission and humility. In the act of worship, we lay down everything we've allowed to matter more than God's perfect will for us and receive the grace to love him above all else. Now jot that down, note taker. The first thing I want you to understand about love is first of all responding that what do I have that I've not received? So this worship comes from the fact that I was worshiping, I was made to worship this creator, created to have this creator. And what do I do? The first element of worship is laying down 
anything that I might have in priorities of anything other than him. And only when I do, that's when I begin to get this grace to receive, to hear, to know, and respond into his love. You see, the point that I want you to get is this. When we read Psalm 95, it says, oh, come let us sing for joy. And I believe this is why today we recognize this term of singing and worship. Why do we say word, worship, you know, I mean, worship, and then the word, and then worship? Because we're using a vernacular that everyone recognizes worship. You go onto your own uh, Pandora, it'll say worship tunes or worship music. But understand something with me. This is what it says in Psalm 95 as it continues. I ended at verse 3, now I pick up at 4. In whose hands are the depth of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are what? His also. The sea is his. It was he who did what? Made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. What? Okay. So he started off, look at me, please. He started off with saying, okay, let's come and sing. Let's shout. He said, shout twice. And then he tells us why. And he starts listening off that he is the creator, that he is the maker. He is the giver, provider, the one who formed. Where would they learn that? How would they know that? The answer is Torah. It was through the word of God, through the reading and the studying of the Torah. We would call it the Old Testament or the Pentateuch. By God's word, they were then now responding to this revelation of information of who God is. And it was blowing their minds. And so the response was, let us sing. Let us shout for joy. Think with me, church. How many times have you seen in the Old Testament when the church went astray? And then when like Ezra finds the book and they start reading and the people are shouting and they're crying out saying, oh, how have we been missing this? And some of you, you walked away from God and you darkened the doors of this or another church and God's word was being read and you were just like, oh, how have I been missing this, this love that Father has for me? You see, family, what I want you to note is this. Yes, worship is part song, but the song always is a response to the revelation that comes from his word. Amen. It comes from his word word. By the way, what is his word? Or maybe I should put it this way. Who is his word? Jesus. Yeah. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was what's God in the word? Yeah, but that word did what in verse 14? Became flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, even first John 1, he even calls him this special name, which I think is super cool. He calls him the word of life. Who is the word of life? Jesus, God is the word. And so now we begin to understand that. So now let me help you get what I need to take you to. What I'm trying to share with you is this. Give me your attention, please. We're talking about bringing this whole tithe. And God says, now test me in this. I'm helping you understand what this is. What is the this? So that you can do that this. How do we bring this response that God is looking for? So I'm first telling you that it says worship. But we seem to think that worship is always the emotive time. That's worship. Where we have our hands in the air and we sing and we feel good or feel an emotional stride. And the first thing that we've seen is that in the Torah, when they worshiped, it was always a response to God's revelation of himself. Are you with me? Psalm 119, 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to what? According to your word. So I've been looking at your word, and I see, Lord, what you're doing. Teach me good judgments and knowledge, for I believe what? Your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep what? Your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Mm. So here, David is obviously crying out to God. And how does he cry out to God? By the revelation from his word. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. What is causing him to have such joy in God? The revelation of God's law. His commandments. Oh, I don't like reading the Bible. It's all about commandments and law. Ooh. You guys must not be reading the same book. 
because this guy's on fire. This guy's going, what up? I love it. It's my meditation all day long. God comes to Joshua, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but what? Meditate on it day and night. What religion have you bought into? Because I'm not sure it's Christianity. I'm not sure it's the worship of Jehovah Jireh. Because if it's all of a sudden this law affair, this moral code, God was striking the congregation in Malachi's day and saying, you're doing all of this stuff, but you're not having worship. And you can't worship if you don't know my love. And if you don't know my love, you don't know my heart. And I can't give you my heart. And this whole thing is stopped. He says, return to me so I can return to you all that I want to give you. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them up. Your word was to me, what? The joy of my rejoicing of my heart, for I am called your name, O Lord God of hosts. Oh my gosh, I saw it, and I just was, Rah! Hey, you guys are just looking at me. Okay, totally love apricots. You go to Costco, you get the tray. You know here in Hawaii, huh? it's kind of hit and miss. Cindy's gone, kind of on my own for food. <laughs> I buy the thing, I sat down, whole, oh, one bite, everything, texture, flavor, sweetness, perfect. Did I eat just one? No. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. I left two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're done. <laughs> no. In my defense, they were only about that big, you know? Oh, yeah. And so, is that your quiet time in the morning? I mean, look at this. Your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me joy, rejoicing in my heart. Why? Because he's learning how much God loves him. For I'm called by your name. Oh my gosh, the guy who said, let there be light is the one that went on the cross and said, Father, forgive them because he doesn't know what he does. Yeah. What? What? Ezra 7.10, for Ezra said in his heart to study the law of the Lord and to, oh yeah, let's not forget that part, and practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinance in Israel. It became part of him and he wanted to share it with those who were around him. 2 Timothy 2.15, God says, be diligent. In, in the King James, it says, study to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be what? Ashamed, why? We're handling, what does it say? Accurately what? Oh, handling accurately the word. See, when churches start going left and right and people start saying, well, you guys have all these different opinions and stuff, not if you're sticking to the text. But if you're starting with feeling first, if you're starting with these other things, then you're going to go in all different directions. The difference is called proof texting, making the Bible back up what you want it to say, or you learning what the Bible says, and you learn it, know it, and, and live it. You see, any response, any experience, any real revelation in the church, in the people in the Bible, was ran through first the known word of God. And that's why Pastor Chuck used to teach us years ago. He would say, listen, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. And yet, come on, stick with me here. Why is there this perverse thing within us that, again, there's so many Christian websites and conferences that, hey, come and understand this hidden teaching, this hidden meaning, this deeper, and we're like, ooh, I want to go to that. Because you see, you went to this church and all of a sudden Pastor Waxer said something that you didn't know before. And you're like, oh wow, that's really cool. And then you're online going, what other hidden mysteries are out there? There's a difference between being ignorant and things being hidden. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So we have this whole idea. It starts with the known word of God. So I'm asking you, what is worship? So we know it's not just singing time. The worship isn't when we have this emotive sponsor where we're listening to the, the songs in the radio. And now we're learning that worship is all part of first the reflection of the character of God through his word. He would reveal his word to his people. So what is worship? Well, look at one commentator who said this. 
Scholars said this, when we worship, we enter into direct contact with our all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, heavenly what? Father. Psalm 132 says, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. It's footstool. Now listen to me. God's desire. Not with you and I. Don't come here and give me this look. Aren't you looking at me at one time? This better be good today. Hey, I brought a friend. God's desire in worship is to draw us near what? To himself. How has worship services been in God's checklist this last month? Has it drawn you to himself? He says he wants to draw us to himself. Number two, fill us to overflow with what? Oh, it's not knowledge. Oh, I learned something here. I come here because this goes deep. Then I failed you. We're not to be lovers of knowledge. We're lovers of the giver of knowledge. To fill us to overflow with his love and wait. What's that word? Oh, he didn't say it strong enough. What word? Patiently for us to love him in return. That's worship. God says, come, sit, and then he begins to reveal himself and his character through his work. And then we wait on the Lord as we begin to have this epiphany and understanding that no matter what I've done, God loves me. As we spoke about in the beginning, I might have an unplanned pregnancy, but not an unknown pregnancy by a God who knows all, who loves all and forgives all and knew what I was going to do and died on the cross for it long before I did it. Wow. See, the more often we receive his love through worship. Again, what is worship? It's not just this one part. It's all of it. When we're bringing the things and the tithes and offerings, and when we're celebrating in song, when we're studying the word of God, when we're in our living room with him, it says the more often that we receive his love through worship, the more consistently, oh, there's a word that's absent in our culture, the more consistently we will love and honor him in what? All that we do. Amen. Hallelujah. So remember now, we're connecting dots here today. So test me now in this. What is the this that's bringing this whole tithe? Bring your whole heart, your whole understanding of my love. Respond to love with love. And it's not, oh, I surrender one-tenth. No, 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 no. It's not a mathematical. It's not a formula. It's when I come to God with all because I understand that he has given all. And so this is what I want you to jot down. We can only bring, he says, test me in this. What is it, this, bringing the whole tithe? We can only bring the whole tithe when we have been holy in worship. And I didn't spell that with an H. It's with a W. I can only bring the whole tithe when I have holy, meaning through word, through meditation, through waiting and through responding in song or reflection or psalm or words or journal. He says, that's when I'm bringing the whole tithe because I'm sitting there going, I am so stinking overwhelmed. That was amazing. One of the reasons why I love teaching people to surf is that first wave that they stand up. (laughs) No one is ever going to take that from them. Ever. And had the privilege one time to teach a blind, one-legged man to surf. And he claimed it. He had to throw that prosthetic up so his front leg was the prosthetic. And so we taught him and pushed him and then he paddled and starts going for it. And we're yelling, stand up, stand up. And he whips that thing up, takes his knee from down, comes and he stands up and he's completely blind. But he knows he's got it. And he feels the rush and he's just screaming, just going, woo! And the world champion at that time, Tommy Curran, was standing right next to me and he goes, What the heck am I complaining about? Goes, what am I complaining about? Just this, ah, oh, worship. What is the whole? Hear me now, the whole means, when we bring the whole, it's the full understanding that God loves you. Now jot that down and let me explain it. 
What is the whole tithe? It's the full understanding that God loves you. Now, even when I wrote this, I struggle with that because when we're saying, well, it's the full, because our mind wants to go, well, but God continues and that's exactly it. Here's my point. God says, bring to me your full understanding. Some of you brand new in the faith. So here we go. A communion cup can be full. So we bring the full understanding of what God has done in our lives. And as we, wow, Lord, this and that, and you're beginning to read the word, and some of you are saying, well, I haven't been in the Bible as long as these other people, it doesn't matter. God's gonna be going, woohoo! When you bring your full communion cup, because all that he has revealed to you, you're like, oh gosh, you're amazing, and you bring that. But the best part is, as you stick with God, it doesn't stay communion cup. Oh no, it should go about to swimming pool. And God says, I'm gonna give you more and more revelation because when you get this and you understand this, then all of a sudden I'm gonna show you this and I'm gonna show you this and then all of a sudden, what? And how many times have you guys even told me, I've seen that same verse forever and I never even really realized that or I keep reading my same devotion over the whole week and God showed me something different every day, amen? amen. That's called the pool's getting bigger, folks. This is what I'm beginning to talk about when he's going to say next week about these promises, why it's so mind-blowing, why it's not but sitting in a church. It's nothing to do with, just like cash, it has nothing to do with tithing. And I told you before, keep it. Definitely don't want you to bring it and put it here in the box if you're doing it because you feel you have to do it. It's, this isn't the house for that. Not at all. Understand. God says something. Put these two side by side. Worship is bringing what you got. Amen. Bringing your full understanding that I love you. That I love you. And God says, if you respond to my love in love, then something even more amazing happens. This is blowing me away. He says, you begin to respond to my love. See, you bring this whole thing. Now test me in this wax. Test me. If you do it my way, take my word, my will, now do it my way. And you bring it this way. You respond to what I've given to you in love. And you do this. So how do I do this? And he says, well, I suggest you do it the way I did it. I was giving unto you because I love you. So now that you understand that I've given to you, then now take that gift and bring it back in with the response of love, not with the sense of duty. Don't want it. Keep it. But when we get, wow, this is how I'm loving on the God who loves me, holy smokes. God says, once you catch that, oh, something amazing is around the corner. Beloved, my favorite way to worship, whether it's in corporate worship, whether it's in my morning devotion time, is to first set down before God and basically come to him and say, Lord, I ask you now to open my heart and that you would speak to me, that I would have further revelation, that the Holy Spirit would come in and upon me, that I would have a deeper knowledge of your love for me, your promises, your affection for me. And folks, you pray that prayer, my sermons get better. Amen. They do. Because you said, God, Holy Spirit, I need to hear it and open my eyes. And then all of a sudden you're, and you're like, wow, he was bringing it tonight. No, you just prayed the right prayer. <laughs> and the same thing in my quiet time. You know, you know who taught me this? My wife. When we first started dating. Here I was, seminarian waxer. <laughs> you know, working on my master's of theology here. And we were talking about how we do devotions and I had, you know, my scholarly way. And I was like, and so what do you use? You know, I was expecting it to be something, you know, like our daily bread or guidepost or something that had to be like, oh, that's fine, that's nice. <laughs> she says, well, it doesn't really matter. I do a whole bunch of different things, but what I do first is I just stop before I do my devotions and I say, thank you, Jesus, good morning. As I visit with you today, please reveal to me whatever it is that I need to know about you and your plans. I sat there like, oh dang. 
because I was looking for knowledge and she was coming to Father. And I was rebuked. Amen? Amen. Big difference. And then you wonder why she's got that smile on her face all the time, even being married to me. <laughs> Folks, 1 John 4, 19, I've been saying it. We love, why? Because he first loved us. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I can too easily forget how deeply God loves me. Any amens out there? Amen. See, I can go through a week and all of a sudden the cares of this world seem to creep in and here's my word choice and rob me of the full understanding of the depth of God's love. Now, wait a minute. What is John 10, 10? The thief comes to what? Oh, yeah. So all of a sudden, I'm getting robbed of the full understanding of the depth of God's love. That's why he makes you busy being under Satan's yoke, B-U-S-Y. Robbing you of this full understanding and then missing the whole reciprocity because the more you learn, then the more you give back, and the more you give back, then the more God blesses, and then you're just going, what? Shout joyfully to the Lord, and you're writing psalms. Listen, I continually need a reminder of his love, listen to me, so that I may live my life in response to him. And I'm going to say this and hear me clearly, not just singing songs. I'm not saying the sing time because I hear people like, well, that's why I know I'm not into the sing time, so I just leave. No, 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 no. I'm not saying wrong. I'm saying it's not just. Worshippers of spirit and what? Truth. So the truth and the study of the word of God and then the spirit of the word, the law of the word, the love of the word begins to flow and I respond. You can't just sit still. People say, what is that guy on? No, I've had no coffee in a month. It's not, it's not Java Jaira. It's Jehovah Jaira. Folks, rather than just singing, listen to me, and then going out and succumbing to temptation all week long. I sure hope I struck a chord there. Does your Christian service look like, man, I'm dragging my butt in on the weekend because, man, I've been going, purr, 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 just skidding the plane on the drive, and then you come in here, and it's like, oh, whew, grace, love, awesome. Oh, all right, you're awesome. And then you leave this place, and sometimes before you even get home, you flip the bird on someone who cut you off. Your wife said something and why do I always have to hear you? And all these things. You see, just sing time. Just sit and listen time. Then you are just going to go out and have succumb time all week long. To the temptations and the wiles of the devil. See, that's not what God's planned for you. If you've been a Christian two, five, six, ten years, and you're still stumbling constantly on these little trips, then we need to begin to understand, do I really, really spend time to understand the full understanding of the depth of God's love that the whole book of Malachi is saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Return to me. But I fear too often church services are like pep rallies. Pep rallies. Remember those? Yay, yay, woo, woo. Please forgive me for any of you that are in this group, but when I graduated class of 82, at that time, Pac-5 was the worst football team you could possibly imagine. Okay, I think we never won a game the entire season of my junior year. And yet we would still have these pep rallies. And Go, we're going to win. Destroy Punahou. Yay, we're like, uh-huh. <laughs> they got money, okay? <laughs> and yet, everyone's like, woo, woo, they're doing all seven, yay. And then all of a sudden, we kick off. And as soon as we kick off, the Punahou guy in the end zone catches the ball to the 5, to the 10, to the 20, to the 30, crosses to the 40, all the way through. Boom, boom, guess what? He ran all the way back for a touchdown on the kickoff. We went from 10 minutes before the game going, woo, woo, woo. We're like, oh, we suck. <laughs> Is church a pep rally for you? Because it's not going to last very long. My job is not to stir you, to excite you, to feed you. It's to help remind you you are loved. To connect 
the dots that you are loved. Listen, I constantly need the reminder of his love. And you know where do I find it, church? I find it in his word because his word tells me about his character. And when I see how he was, when he came to each of the individuals in the Bible where he should have slammed them, but instead he brought grace, he finds Gideon hiding in a cave and he says, hey, mighty warrior. (laughs) And so I don't know about you, but worship means consistently finding myself in the word that gives me the response to want to sing and shout and and be in joy. I constantly need it. So what do I do? I surround myself with it. And I'm not not just making this up. Here's a picture because I was sitting there making my, doing my sermon. That's my office. So now you see how messy it really is. So there it is. But you see, Right there, I have these scriptures on the right there. I have these scriptures over here on the left. So I'm looking up every time I'm standing up. I got these Philippians 4. That's my compassion child. And these are the things that are around me in my office. But gosh, even in the bathroom. Hey, turn potty time into godly time. And so I got God's promises when I'm there because you're usually pretty still there for at least two or three minutes. You know what I'm saying? And now think about it, church. With all the stuff going on in my life right now, the lawsuits, the this and that, all the stuff going on. Will we be able to be here even any further because the gentrification and releasing, I mean, reinstanding our lease, all these different things that everyone else who comes in and goes, oh, it's got VBS today. I've been dealing with a whole lot more. And this is what it says on my wall every day. Isaiah 41, 9. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you, Waxer, and have not rejected you. And do not fear, because brother, I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all Those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but you won't even find those. You won't find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. Verse 13, for I am the Lord wax your God, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Now, if you don't think that encourages me every day. Oh, oh, bro, how come you always like this in the Lord and one and I wonder how you don't? Because garbage in, garbage out. Jesus in, Jesus out. We do not start with emotions. Nor do we even start with because I want it to be. You know how many times I'm dealing with people in this church and all around? with doctrine that they came about because I can't believe in a God who would do this. I can't say, or I have friends who struggle with this and because they struggle with this, then maybe that's not there. And they go on the web and try to find all different ways to isogetically, meaning have other scriptures try to go around about. We cannot start with what we want or what we want to feel. We start with God's word, God's will, and then we do it God's way. That's why this locomotive last week, fact, faith, feeling. What drives us is the fact. Then we put our faith in that fact because we've seen him prove himself over and over and over and check out that that caboose. It's feeling. It's there. My response is a beautiful thing. And even at times, if you know trains, a caboose could actually help back the train up a little bit if it just needed to move back onto a track or something. There's times when we need that feeling to sometimes get us through. Can I get an amen? But that is not where I start out. That is not my substance. One scholar wrote this, and I love it. I fear that many Christians engage in worship because they feel they should or are allotted a time in church to do so, but all the while never really desire to worship God. God is not a prideful king who demands inauthentic praise from his people. He is in no way insecure or needy. He is simply after true communion with you where he loves you and you love him in return. Wow, that's worship. Responding to the love that has always been before you, even in the midst of your sin and in your rebellion, and by that response, even in the midst of that kolohe time, you remember God's love, you respond to his love, and God will divulge you further into his love, into his knowledge, and into his understanding. And then 
things start being clearer. It is then, church, and only then, will you have an authentic, life-changing experience. Not mood-changing, not weekend-changing, but life-changing encounter with God. I could not say it any deeper or better than this. Discipleship means personal, passionate devotion to a person, our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a vast difference between devotion to a person and devotion to a principles or a cause. Our Lord never proclaimed a cause. He proclaimed personal devotion to himself. To be a disciple is to be a devoted bond servant motivated by love. For the Lord Jesus, many of us who call ourselves Christians are not truly devoted to Jesus. No one on earth has this passionate love for the Lord Jesus unless the Holy Spirit has given it to him. We may admire, respect, and revere him, but we cannot love him on our own. The only one who truly loves the Lord Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And it is he who has poured out into our hearts the very love of God. Romans 5. It is in the understanding of his love, then by him, his Holy Spirit upon me, I'm now able to be a worshiper in spirit and truth, clean hands and a pure heart, and I can bring the whole tithe. And God says, Chancel, test me in this. Taste and see. I will bless you. God is saying to every one of you here today, know my love, experience my love, and bring your love and trust to me. And when you do that, <laughs> then we'll see it next week. Third element, the promise of God, where he says this, and I quote, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until what? Until it overflows. overflows. Like I told you, people would ask my mom, Kathy, how you doing? Her answer, sipping from the saucer. My cup overflows. She just... Are you full? Whether it's communion cup, whatever element you are, because God says, test me in this, and I would be unfair to all who hear me. Now or later, on TV or radio, if I didn't also let you all know this, test me in this also goes both ways. It goes both ways. Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said to them, did you not ever read the scriptures? I mean, this is on you. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. The very thing you needed, you were going all around it the whole time, but it was the very thing the whole building was to stand on, your whole sustenance. This came about from the Lord, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and it will be given a nation to a nation producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone, notice, will be broken to pieces. But whoever it falls... It will scatter him like what? Dust. Dust. God says, today you may get the revelation of, wow, God, I haven't been sitting still. I haven't been taking this time of responding in love. I've been going through the motions. And God says, fall on this rock. Fall on the rock that's Jesus. And you'll be broken. Amen. I need to be broken. God loves to use broken things. But he says, you have a choice today. And that is either fall or be broken or let the rock fall on you. And you will be crushed like dust. And he's talking about eternity. So friends, test him in this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, begin to acknowledge him, direct him, and watch him blow your minds about your path. Amen? Amen. See, the good news that I shared last week, simply, God made us so we're ultimately accountable to him. God loves us. He sent his son to tell us so, showed us what it looked like. God demonstrated his love when he died on the cross for you and me. So number three, God paid. He paid the price for your sin and mine. But number four, 
you decide. You choose. He says, choose this day whom you will serve, whom you will respond to. Will you respond to the crowd? Will you respond to the approval and applause of men? Will you respond to these things of the temporal realm? Or will you today say, I want to respond to the everlasting love of an everlasting God? Amen? Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you got to ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and today I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area, get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says, because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.